Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Job. Uh, we're going to begin with chapter 31 tonight. If you have not seen the previous studies we've done on Job, uh, the first 30 chapters, they are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will go back and, and uh, watch it from the beginning. <clears throat> um, this particular book, um, I find myself having to kind of give you a brief summary of the book. Uh, almost every video I have to summarize what we've covered just because if you don't have the context, you can come to some horribly wrong conclusions uh, by just reading one chapter by itself. But um, So I might find it necessary to do that again tonight. But before we begin, let me ask these two brothers to introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Hello, it's me again, the homo. Okay, God bless you. I love you. Back to you guys. Hey, brothers. It's me, Stephen, also known on YouTube as Stephen Rivers TV. Okay, uh, I thank you for both for joining me tonight, and I, I hope that anybody watching this video will subscribe <coughs> to their YouTube channels. All right, um, I am a KJV firstist, so I will read the chapter 31 in the KJV first, and then I, <coughs> I probably will be looking at it also in the Amplified because... I find the Amplified helpful. It's like reading a commentary. It, 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 it expounds upon the verses. So let's do that first. Chapter 31, the book of Job. I'll just read it straight through, uh, and then uh, we'll come back and go through it more slowly. <coughs> uh, this is uh, Job continuing to talk, uh, and he's continuing in this speech that he's, he's done for the last one or two chapters. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity, or if my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. If my step hath turned out the way, and mine heart walked after mine eyes, and if any blot hath cleaved to mine hands, then let me sow, and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. If mine heart have been deceived by a woman, or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others uh, bow down upon her. For this is a heinous crime. Yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For it is a fire that consumeth to destruction, and would root out all mine increase. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or, or my maidservant uh, when they contended with me, what then shall I do when God riseth up? And when he visiteth, visiteth, what shall I answer him? Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? If, if I have withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless hath not eaten thereof. For my youth was brought up with me as with a, a father, and I have guided her from my mother's womb. If I have seen any perish for wanting of clothing, or any poor without covering, if his loins have not blessed me, and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate, then let mine arm fall from my shoulder blade and mine arm be broken from the bone. For destruction from God was a terror to me, and by reason of his highness I could not endure. 
If I made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because mine hand had gotten much. If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth hath kissed my hand. This also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied that God that is above. If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found me, neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. If the men of my tabernacle said not, Oh, that we had his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveler. If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempt of families terrify me, that I kept silence and went not out of the door? Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me, and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto him the number of my steps, as a prince would go would I go near unto him. If I lay if 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 my land cry against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, let thistles grow instead of wheat, and cockle instead of barley, the words of Job are ended. The title for that chapter uh, in the Amplified is Job Asserts His Integrity. So uh, if you had to sum it up in just a few words, that's how the Amplify uh, titles that chapter. Let me get your each of you to just react to that before we go through it slowly. Brother Luke, you were supposed to let me guess the title, remember? Okay, go ahead. I'm good. Brother Stephen, you still there? Go ahead. Yeah. Woo. I mean, that was a lot. I mean, that's what I was going to... This is actually one of my first times actually reading this chapter, but I was about to guess that would have been probably what the title would have been looking at this because he's just wondering, like... At least as far as I can see it, it looks like he's just saying, you know, where did I go wrong and, like, where did I sin? You know, that, like, something like this is, like, come on me. So it's, like, yeah, like, he's trying to figure out pretty much, like, he's, like, searching himself. It's, like, where, where did I go wrong here? That's about all I have for this so far. Yeah, well, for quite a few chapters now, we've had... Uh, Job's visitors. I, I, I've called them his friends. I've called them his so-called friends because even though I think they're pretending to be friends, they, they really, friends like that I wouldn't want. Uh, they're just condemning him, blaming him, accusing him. And uh, so you have these speeches from these three visitors, each one making a, 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 a tirade, a, a diatribe against Job. They're very eloquent and they're very accusatory and then Job comes back and makes a speech giving his defense. And it's gone back and forth like that for many chapters and this is not the first time that Job has, has claimed his righteousness and some of the things he says in there were to me like really amazingly, really profound. I mean if, if, if Job is saying exactly the truth about himself, and I have no reason to believe any of his claims are false, um, then he truly is the, the, the best example. God said, have you considered my servant Job? He said to Satan. I guess I believe that God, God gave um, uh, the name of Job to Satan because that was the best he could offer from all of mankind. That's how good Job was. He truly was righteous in terms of 
uh, compared to other people. Boy, he was head and shoulders above them in his goodness. And and so he's that's what he keeps claiming. And uh, uh, so part of this is, uh, as you said, Brother Stephen, you know, uh, he's wondering why this is happening to him since he's he's innocent. And he also is under the misimpression that God is doing this these bad things to him and that his convin his friends are saying God is doing it to you because you're wicked and so Job is saying well I'm not wicked look and then that's that's what we should be getting from this chapter is Job's claims and defensive of his integrity uh, okay let me go through it slowly but first let give you each of you a chance to respond to that you know brother Luke I was convicted when I heard the string of charitable deeds that Job did in that chapter. And I couldn't even begin to compete with Job. I might be able to keep up with the Apostle Paul, but not Job. Okay, back to you. <laughs> there, there were a few of the verses that I just read. A few of those uh, t sounded to me like it was like the, the, this uh, could have come out of the mouth of Jesus. Uh, and when we get to them, I'll tell you which ones I would, came to my mind. Okay, Brother Stephen, anything uh, before we go on? Well, I have to agree with Eric. I mean, I definitely couldn't compete with Job, but um, I mean, yeah, because Job was definitely. For a man, he was definitely very righteous, as you know, because I do remember the start. You know, him saying, you know, have you not considered my servant Jacob? And then how, you know, he got in this bet with the devil where the devil was like, you know, he will curse you, you know, if I, you know, take away all his stuff and if I can inflict him with all these diseases. And it's just insane, you know, to seeing like his friends, because I do remember like his wife, his friends, everybody's like all turning against him. And I mean, yeah, like. He's basically just receiving the punishment, you know, that he just doesn't deserve in this spot. But, I mean, he does, but he's staying, he's staying steadfast, but yet at the same time, he's sitting here, like, just wondering. All right. I, I've, that's about all I got for now, so let's go into more detail on this. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we, I, I've talked, I probably said it a thousand times in my videos over the years, referencing... Uh, the, the statement of Jesus and Paul about the law of reaping and sowing. And it is a law. It applies to believers and, and non-believers. There is a law of reaping and sowing. You, and, you know, when you, if you uh, sow good in your life by doing good things and hard work and doing the right things, you know, generally you're going to reap good things back in your life. And conversely, if you're sowing bad things, you're being dishonest and hateful and uh, all these things, then, you know, you're going to reap bad things. That's, that's the law. But on the other hand, sometimes Job was asking, why is it some of the people who are so bad, they, they seem to do so well? Uh, so it, it, it doesn't always, we don't always see it in our lives. Uh, when we examine people's lives, you can't say if, absolutely that every time someone is rich or successful or their life's good, it's because that they were a good person. Uh, and sometimes people have bad things happen to them, like Job here. That's the best example of all. Bad things happen to him, but he doesn't deserve it, as you said. And so in this case, is Job reaping what he's sown? No. He, he's, he, has, he should be reaping blessings because of the way he's lived his life. And up to this point, he has. He's been totally blessed. But now, because his life has fallen apart, his his family's killed, his property's destroyed, his health is ruined, and, and um, so his his visitors are saying, this is the law of reaping and sowing. See, you're getting what you deserve because you're wicked. But Job is saying, no, I, I don't deserve this. So that's, uh, that's <clears throat> where we are. Now let's go through this uh, a little bit more like a verse at a time here in the Amplified. It says in verse 1, I have made a covenant agreement with my eyes. How then could I gaze lustfully at a virgin? Uh, so he's going to make a series of claims of, about his, his uh, righteousness here. 
so he he won't lust for a virgin, you know, or, or a woman. You know, just Jesus said it's not just uh, committing adultery, but even thinking about it is a sin. And so he's saying the same thing here. He hasn't even thought about it. He doesn't even gaze at women with lust. Then verse 2, for what is the portion I would have from God and what heritage from the Almighty on high? Uh, let Before I go on, let me get your reaction to those two. But the second verse here, uh, I'd like particularly to explain to me. I'll read it again. For what is the portion I would have from God and what heritage from the Almighty on high? I'm not quite sure right offhand, Brother Luke, what that's saying. Uh, let's see if uh, uh, Brother Stephen might have a clue. All right. Well, looking at verse number one, I mean, this is the first statement of, like, integrity. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why should – then should I think upon a maid? So it's like – he says at the end that I've made an agreement to you, so why should I even, you know, have lust for this? And then it's like, I guess looking at there, maybe like what I could derive from verse 2, it's like, why am I inheriting this? Like, why is this coming onto me, you know, after I've just made such a covenant onto him? Yeah, uh, that, that's right, and the next verse uh, proves it. Yeah, I'll read it in the Amplified. Um, he, for, well, let me read the verse 2 and 3 together. It says, For what is the portion I would have from God, and what heritage from the Almighty on high? Does not tragedy fall justly on the unjust, and disaster to those who work wickedness? Uh, this he's he's uh, presenting the case of, of the law of reaping and sowing right there. He's saying uh, I'm going to I'm going to argue that I've done good and I deserve to get good. I should re be reaping good because I've been sowing good, and uh, and yet uh, it's not working out that way. So before I go to verse four, uh, what's your comment on that? Well, that makes perfect sense, Brother Luke and Brother Stephen. Good job, guys. Okay, sorry, just killed a roach. Anyway, um, all right, looking back at verses, but I mean, yeah, it's pretty much what I was just saying. He's questioning, like, you know, isn't it the wicked that should be deserving this type of punishment? And, you know, and shouldn't it really only people who really reap this should be sowing this type of punishment? He's just literally like, he's just in like shock right now. It's like, why? It's like, and of course, as I already said in, when talking about verse 2, after making the covenant and going so far to follow it, it's like, why is this falling on me? Like, I'm not wicked. And this is supposed to be falling on the wicked. Why me? Yeah. Okay, and in uh, verse 4, does not God see my ways and count all my steps? And this is uh, this is continuing the same thought. He says, "Doesn't God know that I'm doing good? You know, he, he if if God is watching me and keeping track of what I do, He should know that I'm doing good, not wicked wickedness." Verse five: If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has chased after deceit, we're going to have a whole series of if verses coming up, right? If in other words, saying if I've done the bad thing, then I deserve it. But he's but he's denying that he does these bad things. Okay, uh, so before I go to verse six, let me get you respond to that. Uh, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Uh, maybe Stephen can help me out here. All right. Well. I mean, literally, this is just still, to me, it's a continuation, because at this point, he's like, I mean, hasn't he been seeing me? I mean, has he not been seeing what I'm doing? And it's like, it's pretty much, just, it's still just a continuation, pretty much, of just the same case to me, where he's like, he's been seeing me, he's seeing that I'm done right, and it's just still the same question, why am I getting this? All right. Yeah, yeah, so he stated that isn't it supposed to this is isn't this the way it's supposed to work 
the good people get good results, the, the wicked people get bad results, and get bad things fall to the wicked, good things come to the, those who do good. Uh, and, you know, that's, as I said, that's the same principle that Paul and Jesus taught, and Job is stating it. So this is an accepted rule or a principle or law. And, and, and so he's, that's what he's expecting, and he says, but doesn't, isn't God watching? Or God, aren't you paying attention? Haven't you been observing me, keeping track of what I'm doing? You know, then he's going to continue on saying, uh, arguing his case that, no, I haven't done these bad things. Let me go down now to verse, uh, uh, he says, verse 5, If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has chased after deceit, oh, let him weigh me with accurate scales, and let God know my integrity. All right? I'll, I don't want to monopolize this, so it says, uh, oh, let him weigh me with ac accurate scales. Okay? But let me get your reaction to that. Uh, well, I was just skimming through the whole chapter real briefly and quickly, looking at all the if-then statements, and being a programmer, that's very significant to me. What do you think, Stephen? Well, I mean, looking at this one, it's like it's like saying, like, let God be the judge, let him judge me. It's like, what have I done? Oops, forgot to mute there for a second here. Uh, okay, um, so he's saying, God, let him weigh me with accurate scales. In other words, he's believing that he's being judged unfairly. The scale's not accurate. You know how we learned in the book of Proverbs how it talks about always use a, a just scale. Uh, don't don't cheat people. Be honest. Give them a fair measurement. And here Job is, is thinking that God is not treating him fairly, not judging him accurately. Uh, and then verse 7, he says, another if. If my step has turned away from God, or if my heart has covetously followed my eyes, or if any spot of guilt has stained my hands, then let me plant and let another eat from the results of my labor, and let my crops be uprooted and ruined. Okay, go ahead and respond to that. Maybe we should uh, start uh, looking closely at each and individual if and then statement, huh? And to see what kind of a tone it, it's setting, because each one probably strings a, a, makes a different chord sound. Now this one in particular, I'm not quite sure about. Maybe Stephen can figure it out. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm just getting almost repetitive now, but um, well, like this one looking like if my step in it, it's like, well, this time to me it's like it's saying, okay, if I actually have been sinning and I actually have, you know, wandered off from God and backslidden, and, you know, if I've actually let myself slip in lust, I mean, at least as this one implies, then it says, then let me actually sow I mean, sorry, then let me actually reap what I sow and, like, and pretty much eat this one and, you know, let this be passed on. But, you know, if I've actually done this thing, because so far, you know, as you just said, it seems as though he's receiving, you know, an unfair punishment. Well, um, Brother Eric, that's, we are going through each one of these ifs one at a time to get your consideration on it. But um, if we look at it as a whole, uh, he's he's basically um, uh, citing a whole list of possible wrongs that that people do. They're lustful. They're covetous. They're jealous. They're dishonest. They get they are not giving God the, the attention. And he, he's just listing all these things that people do can do wrong. And he's saying, if I've done this wrong, I can see why this is happening. If I've done this wrong, I can see it. But but he's he's not admitting he's done anything wrong. He's claiming he hasn't. Uh, I'll go to the next one. Uh, it says, 
Well, in fact, I like this verse here. Uh, at the end of verse 7, he says, Or if any spot of guilt has stained my hands. So he's, he's listing specific things, but then here broadly he's saying, If I've done any kind of sin. Uh, so he's claiming complete innocence. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I I don't remember if there's some point where uh, we can cite a, a sin of Job. I know when Job and God start dialoguing a, with each other, uh, we'll have to see how we judge that conversation. But uh, I can't see that Job has... Now, we know that everybody sinned, but uh, there's no one that ever lived has been perfect except Jesus. But uh, at least it's this, the standard that Job is, is uh, judging his life he hasn't done these things, and if, if it's all true what he's claiming, then he certainly is an innocent, perfect man, the best example that God could pick out of the whole, all of mankind, for Satan to examine. Then he says in verse uh, 9, If my heart has been enticed, and I was made a fool by a woman, or if I have covetously lurked at my neighbor's door until his departure, let my wife grind meal like a bond slave for another man, and let others kneel down over her. For adultery is a heinous and lustful crime. Moreover, it would be a sin punishable by the judges. Um, so, um, he, he's going to go on, you know, continue on. There's a lot of things he's citing. Uh, so if you if you want to comment on any one of these specifics, like Brother Eric, you said, well, we should examine each one one at a time. So that's what I'm giving you the opportunity to do. Uh, if, if you want to expound on that one verse there, that, that portion of verses. Okay, let's do that. It uh, looks like it's focusing mostly on lust. And then uh, apparently lust... Uh, 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 adultery it doesn't say uh, yeah well uh, it's talking about adultery there adultery being a very heinous crime now I think adultery is not only rooted in lust I think it's also rooted in hatred so it's it's on the branch of lust and hatred because the tree of evil branches out at lust and hate uh, I think uh, Back to you. Uh, very interesting, very insightful comment. But, um, I mean, he's been focusing, you know, on this adultery and in this lust pretty much so far, like almost this whole chapter that we've gone. But looking at this, I mean, he's getting pretty serious, like saying, if my heart had been deceived, like he's literally cutting it to like even just the thought of it, not even you know, not just action, but literally even the slightest thought. Then, or, you know, or if he's even you know come anywhere near this, you know, not even committing the act, but even you know, getting anywhere into the ballpark of this thing, it just shows like how high like this standard is here that he has. Like literally, it just it does remind me a lot of what you know Jesus said that. You have committed adultery if you've even looked at after a woman, you know, in lust. I haven't really thought so much about the hatred comment, though, but I definitely won't disagree with that. But, but you know, looking at this also, saying that it's just a heinous crime, I mean, it's big, you know, both, you know, in the worldly sense, but also, you know, in God's eye, because I believe it was punishable by, you know, death even in the day, but... Of course, you know, Jesus even, you know, took it seriously with, like, that plucking out your eye comment as well. But even though, obviously, that he does save us if we have faith in him. But, yeah, it's just a big time. It's just basically just showing, like, the extent to, like, how seriously he's taking this pretty much here. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you uh, connected the dots on that. That uh, That's what I was uh, alluding to when I made my statement about Jesus' words, is that uh, Jesus made the law even more difficult than the people thought it was. 
the people thought, well, if you if you don't uh, murder someone, you're doing good. But Jesus said, no, even if you hate someone, you've already committed murder in your mind and your heart when you hate someone. And so Jesus took it beyond just our actions and, and, and reduced it to our thought and our hearts. And, and so, so he basically was ratcheting the law down, making it so difficult that finally his apostles would say to him, well, Lord, if that's the case, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So um, that's what I was getting here also from Job, is that Job is not only talking about committing adultery, he's even talking about just lustful thoughts. And So he, is, uh, he has not watered down sin. There's a... We, I think we all know about the term easy believism. It, it's a, it's a, it's a crown I wear with, with honor because I believe salvation is easy. You just believe and trust Jesus, and you go to heaven. Uh, but uh, the Lordship Salvationists, uh, most of Christendom, think that just believing in Jesus is well, that's not quite enough. You're gonna, it's more is expected of you. So they taunt us and mock us and use this term easy believism as a pejorative. Um, but there's another term that, um, that I can throw right back at them, and that is easy legalism. Easy legalism means that you're watering down the law, and, and uh, you're, you're not taking the law seriously. You don't realize that um, even your thoughts are being judged. You think that you know you're not committing any sins. You're so good and perfect. Well, you know you really have you even had any covetous, jealous thoughts? Have you ever lost your, your temper, gotten angry? I mean, uh, really, if you really were to uh, consider how strict the law really is, the way Jesus described it, then who could pass that test? No one can say I'm sinless. So um, that's what I'm getting from Job's Job's understanding of, of sin. Is that he's really he's not watering it down, and 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 all the while he's saying I still am innocent. So that's quite a claim from from Job, I think. Before I go on, your reaction to that, brother Luke. That's brilliant. I just love that easy legalism. Did you come up with that yourself? Uh, Brother Jackson first coined the term. Oh, is that his doctrine? That's a wonderful uh, viewpoint. And I'm so proud of your crown of evil, easy believism, Brother Luke. Yes. Okay, back to you. Okay. All right, well, I mean, yeah, a lot of those... A lot of Lordship Salvationists definitely love to use the phrase easy believism, like trying to make it look like like we're basically believing some, you know, false gospel that like where like of course one excuse that they really like to use is Okay, I just lost it. But um it, it'll come back to me in a second. It Okay, my mind's completely blank. All right, I'll take you off the spot. Take a breath, and then come back in a minute when you're ready to talk about that. But you made me oh, think Oh, there. About... I got it back. Okay, go ahead. Okay, here's what I was going to say. It was um that because then they'll answer you saying, oh, so you believe you can just go on sinning, and you're just advocating sin. That's what they like. A lot of them like to say, like when we believe in this easy believers in that we're just trying to make up an excuse to sin. Well, then again. As you said, though, there, you know, easy legalism and, but again, just like the moder like the Pharisees, like the Pharisees probably had the exact type of, you know, mindset. But at the same time, they were just being very, very, like, boastful. Like, they were just wanting to be praised by people. I mean, I don't know, like, the hearts of all Lordship Salvationists, because I do know a few that were very genuine. But a lot that I have seen seem like they get way too much praise from people. And it just seems like they're just seeking it almost in a way. But anyway, that's about all I have on that for now. Well, I thought I thought that's where you wanted to go with it when I said take a minute. And I was going to make the same kind of a point, so I'll expand on that a little further. 
Um, the the reaction that we get from from people, the Lordship people, who criticize easy believism, they say that you, what you're just doing is you're giving people a license to sin. And we're not saying that at all. We're saying that uh, we don't go to hell if we sin, but if a Christian does sin, there's still some consequences for sinning, but not hell. We still get to go to heaven. Uh, but the um, brother Ronnie, I'll give him credit since I didn't I first identify brother Jackson for the term easy legalism. I better recognize brother Ronnie for coming up with this term. And he he says it's not that we have a license to sin. The truth is we have a license to rest. Uh, once we're saved, we don't have to be under the burden of the law and try to labor and strive. We get to rest in Jesus' arms and have that blessed assurance of our salvation. So, um, uh, all right, I'm going to move on. I think we've covered that thoroughly. Let me go now to verse uh, 13. It says, if, if, I have despised and rejected the claim of my male or female servants when they filed a complaint against me. What then could I do when God arises to judge me? When he calls me to when he calls me to account, what will I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make my servant? And did not the same one fashion us both in the womb? So before I go on to the next if, I mean, uh, how profound is that? Uh, it's too profound for me. <laughs> I'll pass this one. Stephen! <laughs> oh. Okay, I was slightly not paying attention there, but looking back at this, um, if I did despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they contended with me, hold on, before I make an, like, an, a, an actual comment, could you read uh, verses 13 and 14 for me again in the Amplified? Okay, yeah, I was going to suggest that. Um, he says, if I have despised and, and rejected the claim of my male or female servants when they filed a claim against me, what then could I do when God arises to judge me? When he calls me to account, what will I answer him? Um, okay, there's my camera. Um, all right, looking at that. Okay, I guess looking at this, I guess that kind of reminds me of another thing in a way of what Jesus said. If I def if I you know despise you know my manservant and my maidservant, I guess it kind of reminds me of one of the parables of when, like, it was the parable when Jesus left the when like the master left the one servant at home, and then returned, but then found like him mistreating them and like beating them to an extent. So if he's been like mistreating them and like and they're speaking against him, you know, what could he do, you know, when God shows up, you know, what answer do I have to them? Because in reality, you know, if that happened, then there's not. Even though that Job has actually been righteous, that's just a connection that I just remember. It was just that parable. Well, I will say well done, brother uh, Stephen. Uh, that's a very specific example of something that Jesus said that compares to what uh, Job has just said here. Um, that's very good. Uh, and the, the, the point is, is really the same in each case. They're both making the same point. But the, the, in, in jo Jesus' case, he wasn't applying it to himself. He didn't need to. I mean, the only time he applied it to anything to himself, he says, who, who, does, who can... Who can uh, how did he phrase it? Who uh, confuses, can, accuses me of sin, or who uh, who can prove that I've sinned? Um, if you can come up with the exact verse, let me know. But Jesus, that's all he said. He didn't really talk about 
uh, you know, trying to defend himself the way Job is. He didn't need to. He was perfectly righteous. But Job is using these arguments here to make the case that if I've done these things, then okay, punish me for it. But I haven't done that. I haven't. I haven't been unfair to my servant. I haven't cheated on my wife. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. Let me go on now. It says, uh, verse 16, If I have withheld from the poor what they desired, or have caused the eyes of the widow to look in vain for relief, or have eaten my morsel of food alone and did not share it with the orphan, but from my youth the orphan grew up with me as with a father. And from my mother's womb I have been the widow's guide. Before I go on, your reaction to that. Well, Luke, I couldn't help but think that maybe there's some sort of... Uh, some sort of... Uh, order to these if-then statements. Uh... Like, how's he going to do charitable deeds for the poor if he's uh, lusting and hating after people, which he covered uh, before that one? And maybe there's it's in order. Maybe not. I don't know. I, it just occurred to me. Okay, go ahead. All right, well, um, looking more at this, have I withheld the poor from their desire? or caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or eat my morsel alone, and the fatherless have not eaten thereof. Well, I mean, looking at this, it just kind of reminds me of like, yeah, like not being, you know, having charity here. I mean, it's just more examples of, you know, like iniquity that he could have. But a lot of it kind of does remind me of a, of a lot of Jesus' words about, it's like giving, you know, everything to the poor, you know, not being selfish in this way. I mean, I'm not gonna. I mean, this one that reminds me, I guess, of like the rich man instance for when it comes to you know giving to the poor for this one. But there's not really too many other specifics I can really think of looking at this. But there's still a lot of connections to like like a lot of the commands or parables that Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I I don't know if you're. Uh... Um, coming to the same conclusion that, that I am about about this, but um, if James, if Job's claims are true, and uh, I believe they're true, I I I have seen no indication that any of his, his claims are false. But if his claims are true, he truly is the most righteous man I can think of. I mean, we have some people that there's nothing charged against them, like Enoch, like the Apostle John. There's a few examples like that where we, there's nothing they can be embarrassed or ashamed about. But everybody else, look at Adam and Eve, what they did. Look at look at Cain slaying Abel. Of course, he wasn't a hero, but I'm talking about the heroes now. Noah, what did he do? You know, he got drunk. Uh, Moses murdered. Uh, David murdered in adultery. Uh, uh, Paul murdered the church. Peter denied the Lord. All these people we admire, all these great figures that we or we uh, adore and love in the, in the Bible, and yet they have these huge flaws and they're guilty. It's it cleared everybody they're guilty. Job, he's claiming he has no guilt, and and I I don't. There's no indication to me that he is. Um, so I'm just convinced that, you know, I, I'm beginning to really see why, why God picked Job. Uh, okay, before I go on, what's your reaction to that? Yes, Brother Luke. Uh, so it's Enoch, Job, and Daniel are the only ones, really. I can't think of any others. Uh, what about, what do you, okay. Well, I mean, he's definitely looking at this. I mean, obviously, he'll never be anywhere close to Jesus, obviously. But 
because you know all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short. So I mean, obviously he has sinned before, but but looking at this though, he's still doing extremely well. Like, I mean, there's no wonder God would have mentioned him, you know, when talking to Satan, you know, and his demons. And you know, there's no other, you know, I could see no other reason why you know Satan would have picked to torment him because. Literally, like someone who's just persevering, you know, that well, you know, it's just, it's like the perfect person to put to the test in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go on now. Um, uh, verse 19, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or any poor person without covering. If his loins have n not thanked and blessed me for clothing them, and if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted my hand against the orphan because I saw that the judges would be my help at the council gate, then let my shoulder fall away from my, its socket and my arm be broken off at the elbow. He's certainly um, arguing that he's completely innocent and saying, if I've done anything wrong, then punish me. But I don't deserve the punishment. I don't, he just doesn't understand. As we know, he wasn't not there in chapter 1 and 2 when Satan appeared before God and said, uh, I've been around the world and looking at mankind and uh, nobody really loves you. And he, he said, and God said, well, have you considered my servant Job? He's righteous. And and uh, Satan said, well, he only loves you because you've blessed him. Look, look at all the blessings in his life. Let me take away these things from him, and he'll curse you. And God says, okay. And uh, God doesn't, God's not afflicting himself. He's permitting Satan to do it. God knows in his foreknowledge uh, how it's going to all play out, and that and that Job will, uh, you know, will his his uh, righteousness will be proven, and that he will uh, be blessed in the end, much more than even after all his losses and suffering. Uh, but for our benefit, we get to see how a person does. As Brother Stephen said, he perseveres. He perseveres. Uh, boy. Uh, what an example for us. Uh, but he, all the while, he is defending his integrity. As it says, what is that, the title of the chapter? Joy, Job asserts his integrity. And he certainly is asserting it and defending it. Um, now it says, um, verse 23, For tragedy from God is a terror to me. And because of his majesty and exaltation, I can do nothing nor endure facing him. If I put my trust and confidence in gold or have declared fine gold my hope and assurance, if I gloated and rejoiced because my wealth was um, great and because my powerful hand alone had obtained so much, if I beheld the sun as an object of worship, when it shone, or the moon going on in its splendor, and my heart became secretly enticed by them, and my hand threw a kiss from my mouth in respect to them, this also would have been a heinous sin calling for judgment, for I would have denied God above. Uh, I guess we'll have time to get through the rest of it, but let me stop there. I mean, let me pause there for your comments. Oh, why in the world did they throw heinous in there? Uh, I think they went too far. Well, I mean, we've had adultery. We've had, you know, lack of charity so far. And now we're going into, you know, coveting and, you know, an idolatry here. And also, like, you know, loving money. Oh, there's another one. You know, no, you know, no man can serve two masters, as said. You will either love, you know, one, you know, and despise the other. That's another thing I remember. But, but yeah, it's just, it's literally just going sin by sin. Like, you've, we've got like adultery here, 
And now we've gotten to idolatry, and he's, like, saying, you know, I'm innocent, like, all across the board, like, in, like, literally all of these categories. And it's like, if so, then, you know, strike me, but what have I done? I don't think, I, like, I don't deserve to get struck. Yeah. Uh, Job is either a truly innocent, righteous man that is suffering... Um, uh, unjustly, uh, I guess I could say unjustly. I mean, God's not doing it to him, so, but he's being afflicted without cause. He doesn't deserve it. Uh, or he's some kind of a deluded, uh, you know, uh, egomaniac. <laughs> so I, I, I think he's really a great, great saint. Uh, I'll let me go and read the rest here. Uh, verse 29, have I rejoiced at the destruction of the enemy who hated me? Or exulted in malicious triumph when evil overtook him? No, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by cursing my enemy and asking for his life. Let me stop there. Well, uh... I'm glad he didn't uh, curse his his uh, neighbor's soul. Uh, that would have ruined it for him. Okay. Okay, well, now we've gone on to a, another one. So now, well, we've gotten all that other stuff, you know, off the list. But now we get to another commandment, you know, also given by Jesus, you know, in the future. Which was, you know, don't even, you know, hate your brother because, you know, if you hate him, you know, you've committed, you know, adultery or you've assaulted him already in your heart. So if you're sitting here, you know, already rejoicing and like, you know, and just celebrating, you know, hard times coming on him, you know, pretty much, you know, in your heart, you're all, you're the one doing it to him and you're the one who's torturing him or, or you know, and Jesus, as the way Jesus said it, killing him. So, I mean… It's just another extension. It's like, I haven't even done this. It's like, what? Yeah, this is, this is, this is uh, remember when I read it in the KJV originally and I told you uh, the thought kept coming to my mind, the words of Jesus, it sounds so much like Jesus talking that, um, and that, that this is another clear example of that and that uh, Jesus says, you've heard it said, that we should love those who love us, but I say we should uh, love our enemies. And 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 this is isn't this what Job's saying right here? I think it's just it's just beautiful to hear Job say that. And he says uh, he says he's not rejoicing when his enemies fail. I'll read it again very quickly. He says. Uh, 29. Have I rejoiced at this destruction of the enemy who hated me or exulted in malicious triumph when evil or overtook him? No, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by cursing my enemy and asking for his life. I assure you, the men in my tent have said, who can find one in need who has not been satisfied with his meat? The stranger has not lodged in the street because I have opened my door to the traveler. Have I concealed my transgressions like like Adam? Or well, let me stop there before I go on. So he's even talking about he's never turned away a person in need. Well, he's got me beat. Okay. Yep. Pretty much. All I can you know say to this is. This is pretty much a continuation of what, and pretty much what I've just been saying. Now, you know, continuing to go down the list, just proving his innocence, you know, one by one by one by one, pretty much. Well, he's not only saying that I did not do this bad thing, but I've done the exact opposite. I've been very generous and kind and loving. It's I'm not like I've just, okay, I haven't harmed people. That would be one thing. Well, I never harmed anybody. But he's saying, not only did I not harm them, but I've tried to help everybody. So it's he's just uh, example after example of him doing the right thing. Uh, even I've talked about 
when I uh, when I talk about this uh, easy legalism problem, these people they 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 water down the law so much that they can really convince themselves that they they don't sin anymore. But that what they don't understand is the strictness of the law. You you sin is not just committing a bad act, but but sin is even thinking about it, as Jesus said. And then we can go the opposite way and say sin is also the failure to do good acts. In other words, that's a sin of omission. You omitted it. You neglected it. There was someone you were able to help, and you neglected to do it. That's a sin of omission, uh, omission rather than a sin of commission. And Job is saying, not only did I not turn my back on people who needed my help, but I went overboard to try to help everybody. Uh, now verse 33, I'll read this through the end here. Have I concealed my transgressions like Adam or like other men by hiding my witness, wickedness in my bosom because I feared the great multitude and the contempt of families terrif uh, and the contempt of families terrified me so that I kept silence and did not acknowledge my sin and did not go out of the door? Oh, that I had one to listen to me. Look, here is my signature, my mark. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my adversary write out his indictment and put his vague accusations in tangible form. Surely I would proudly bear it on my shoulder and bind the scroll around my head like a crown. I would count out to him the number of my steps with every detail of my life, approaching his presence as if I were a prince. For if my land has cried out against me, and its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without paying for them, or have caused its rightful owners to lose their lives, let thorns grow instead of wheat, and stinkweed and cockleburs instead of barley. So the words of Job with his friends are finished. Well, I guess that last statement is telling me that the uh, this constant uh, arguing back and forth with his so-called friends uh, is ending here. I'm assuming from this point on uh, we won't have any more of that um, if that last statement is what I think it is. But okay, so let's get your final thoughts on this uh, whole chapter here, and then we'll do uh, tell people the good news about the free gift. Wow, I love how uh, we related everything that Job said, every if and then statement can be found in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, I'm going to uh, cross-reference that and check to see if, there's, uh, if that is actually true or not uh, and get back with you. Uh, and I love how uh, Stephen stated that uh, God sure did pick the right guy to put to the test because when Job suffers he does it with class okay back to you guys um yeah like looking at this chapter literally well I'm going to flip this over literally like the um the whole time he's just sitting here you know showing off his case you know, just going sin by sin, you know, proving not only not does he, you know, not do wrong, even to the level of his heart, you know, not just his mind, but, like, to show that, you know, he also goes out of his way to try to help everybody, you know, as God says that, you know, that we should do, you know, to have charity for everybody. And, I mean, as I said, I mean, he still sins, but he definitely was the optimal pick. But now to respond to the second part that uh, Brother Luke talked about, you know, to talk a little bit about the good news of Jesus. Well, I mean, there's a lot of ties because a lot of this related to a lot of the parables or sermons that Jesus gave. But, of course, the big point that Jesus gave us is that none of us are righteous, you know, no, not one. And that anything that we try to do is all of our works are like filthy rags before God. Like what Brother Luke says, a lot of, like, Lordship Salvationists or other people I've seen here on YouTube or elsewhere— 
you know, think that they can be sinless. They think they can be perfect, and they think that they're good enough in front of God. Or some of them will even have a weird beliefs and think that God won't even listen to your prayers if you're not good enough. But that's just another extreme. But the thing is, Jesus already said that no one's good enough. It doesn't you know, matter how good you try to be, how righteous you try to be, or how much you try to commit. Like in reality, the only way to be acceptable is it's not through your own effort. It's only through what Jesus did you know, on the cross. You know, Jesus was fully man, fully God, came here in the flesh. He paid the penalty, you know, that we deserved. You know, he died on the cross. He was buried, but then he proved who he was, you know, besides just the miracles he performed, but he proved who he was by rising from the dead again and also staying, this, you know, the statement that he has the authority to take his own life back, you know, proving it by rising again. But also the most important thing is he said that, those who believe on him have everlasting life and have passed on from death to life. So the only way to be sick, and also he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man will come to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to be saved, and he's the only way to be justified. There's no other way, not through your own merit, not through any other like religion or through any method. The only way to be justified and righteous before God and to have eternal life is through Jesus, and he paid the entire sacrifice, you know, in full, you know, the God of this entire universe came down here to this planet because he loved us so much, and he paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, he was the spotless lamb, even more spotless than Job, Enoch, John, and all the people put together, and he was still the only one that could pull this off, and he did it, even though in reality he, he didn't have to. But he pulled it off for us just because he loved us. I mean, yes, he did predict that was, you know, God's plan. But if, you know, he's God. And the fact that he's just willing to save us, it's just huge. So, I mean, that's all I could say is stop looking at yourself, you know, if you are. You know, and stop thinking and worrying about your own righteousness. And instead, just look to the cross. Look to Jesus and what he's done for you. You know, come to faith in him. And he'll save you. He'll be true to his word because everything he said is true on to today and beyond, and his words will never pass away. And everything that he said, he's beyond proved it. Amen. Uh, that's what the, the Bible calls the gospel. And the word gospel, is it's a Greek word, and it literally means good news. And... Uh, Brother Stephen told you what the good news is that salvation is a free gift we receive from Jesus when we believe in him. It's, it's not a reward we get because of uh, our, our uh, behavior or our own righteousness. So that's the thing you need to understand. And, uh, but relating this good news of, about the free gift uh, to the book of Job here, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this series from the beginning. I think it'd be a, a wonderful for you to do that. I hope you'll take the time to watch it all. But probably 10 or 15 chapters ago, we discovered some interesting things that uh, Job believed. Uh, Job did not believe that he was going to go to heaven because of his goodness. Just like I don't believe I'm going to heaven because of my goodness. Um, Job understood that he was a sinner, but he was going to go to heaven because he was trusting God. That's what I believe. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm trusting God. Jesus is our great Savior God. But what about sin? Well, sin is not a barrier between me and God. I can go to heaven even though I've sinned because all my sins were put on Jesus on the cross. So when God looks at me, I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I have no sin. Uh, and in Job's case, Job said that God has put all his sins in a bag and, and tied it shut. And that's because Job lived before the cross. So God had take, taken Job's sins, put it in a bag, tied it up, and then in the future when Jesus was hanging on the cross, God took all of Job's sins out of that bag and put them on Jesus. And Job's sins were all paid for, just like 
Everybody on the past, the present, and the future, everybody who's ever lived, all of our sins were put on Jesus on that cross. So Job had the same kind of faith that, that we have, that um, uh, God, uh, if you had faith in God for your salvation, that uh, you know he was merciful and just, and he would he forgave our sins, and uh, now we, but he didn't know that how it was going to be done. He didn't know about the cross and Jesus. Now we know the the means by which God solved our sin problem, and that is the means was he became God became a man in order to die for our sins. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. Our sins are paid for, and now the most important thing to understand is that. Uh, the reason I'm asking you to trust Jesus and believe in him and have confidence and, and put all your trust in him is because he gave us proof of who he is. He said that uh, he would be uh, die on the cross, he would be buried, and he would be raised back to life. He said that in advance. He, he, he claimed that uh, he would use this death, burial, and resurrection as a sign to prove his claims. The claim that he's God, the claim that he's Savior, the claim that he does have power over life and death. And he was raised from the dead, and he walked for 40 days among 500 witnesses. Uh, they saw him, they talked with him, they touched him. Uh, they, they knew that he did raise himself from the dead. And that resurrection is what should give us all confidence to put our faith in Jesus. All right, brothers. Um, I, I thank you for participating tonight. And uh, I, we're alternating subjects each night, uh, going between the book of Job, the book of Proverbs, the book of John, and a topic uh, of early church history. So I hope you will join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Brother Eric, Brother Stephen, thank you for joining me again tonight. I'll give any, let you make any last words before we close. Oh, it was such a pleasure to be here with you and Stephen and hearing you guys explain the gospel so clearly and so well. Okay. Thank you so much. Back to you guys. Yeah, it was awesome being here tonight. And, of course, it's awesome to be able to fellowship, to be able to, you know, to learn, you know, and for us to just be able to be here together. You know, as Jesus did say, when two or more are gathered in my name, here he is in the midst of us. I mean, I can definitely feel his presence here tonight. But, um, but yeah, the gospel for everybody, it's the most important thing ever for anyone because... I mean, literally, it's like everything rests on that. It's the good news. You know, he went out of the way for you, and all he's asking you to do is believe on him. So, you know, as I said earlier, let's say, it's like, where are you looking? You know, look to Jesus and be saved. Just as he said, you know, in the Old Testament, just as they looked up to the serpent and were saved, look to Jesus and be saved. Let's say, put your faith in him and him alone. God bless. All right. Thank you, brothers. Um, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.